Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, Thriving Farmers, here's a quick heads up to save the date, December 1st through 4th, for our Thriving Farmer Summit, Value Added. If you're looking to add income to your farm with simple, proven strategies, go to www.farmsummits.com and drop your email. Our summit series have been viewed by over 100,000 farmers and get rave five-star reviews. In this summit, we'll share detailed strategies for farm ferments, herbal foraging, tinctures, pickles, farm kitchens, foodscaping, mushroom jerky, and mushroom kits, developing add-on shares for your CSA, how to publish books with your farm story, starting your own USDA processing plant, and starting a farmer co-op. Over 35 speakers are sharing their wisdom. Go to farmsummits.com to reserve your spot today. Hey, Thriving Farmers, Michael Kilpatrick here with yet another episode of the Thriving Farmer podcast. And today my guest is Andre Cantelmo. And Andre uh, farms at Heron Pond Farm, which is owned and operated by Greg uh, Balog and Andre, friends from college where they studied soil science. They have been a team for 20 years. Heron Pond is a four season farm that grows over 250 varieties of vegetables, fruits, herbs, and flowers. Farming year round has allowed them to grow and maintain a incredibly skilled and experienced staff whose passion brings higher yields, quality, and flavor to their food all year long. Andre, I hope I didn't butcher both those last names. You got my name right. Uh, it's Greg Baylog, but that's okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, <clears throat> apologies there. So that's all right. you were on the podcast. I'm just trying to remember when that was. That was actually right in the beginning of 2020, right in the beginning of the pandemic but i think we reported right before it before then yeah we yeah. really talked about mainly potatoes and um um we went into carrot production a little bit but i think that like you know uh, i got i mean a slew of emails from your your yeah. um uh listeners to uh like more potato questions and stuff yeah so, yeah and obviously those are key to like you because you are a pretty big farm so kind of give us a little bit of a overview of the entire operation yeah i mean Big is relative. I mean, we're a pimple on the existence of agriculture in the country world or whatever, yeah. and even in what the state that we live in eats. But um, yeah, we grow um, we grow 60 acres of mixed veg. Uh, we have a lot of rotations. We're highly cover crop dependent. Um, we do a lot of intermixed stuff to make it make it all work, particularly with like the soil side of it. Um, it's, you know, always tweaking that. Um, we have about a, a 700 person summer CSA and anywhere from a four to 500 person winter CSA, depending on the way the wind's blowing that year. Um, we do, um, we have a farm stand. We only, we, we've cut out farmer's markets. So we're down to two and we're seriously considering not doing any anymore uh, of the farmer's markets. Um, we have a wholesale operation that's kind of for our sakes. Um, we do a lot with like a mixed stuff that's, um, you know, overages, but we're really, ta- you know, uh, tailored to tomato production, um, potato um, production, sweet potatoes, carrots. Um, we, we've kind of like streamlined our wholesale instead of being, we used to be generalists with the wholesale and now mm. we're a little bit more refined with that. Um, with what we personally do with our wholesale stuff. But there's always room for those. And you know, is if mm-hmm. you want to produce enough, you're producing too much because, and that's actually um, one last thing I'll add to that, like what a, a, a source for our food is, we've really started to partner with um, both third-party entities so that we can get our food into um, local, um, you Schools? know, the, well, no, not the schools. I'm talking about like um, the food insecure system. So we have ah, a bunch yes. of mm-hmm. we have a bunch of independent, non-state owned um, nonprofits that um, that that are not exactly soup kitchens. They're more like uh, food, and they're beyond food pantries. It's like this like weird hybrid of stuff where they're going for more targeted audience. Like we work with, um, um, you know, ha- um, Habitat for Humanity has a branch that does stuff just for, um, you know, people who are bridging and they just need some, you know, little help. 
But yeah. then some of them can provide funding. So like we actually get paid for some of our food. We donate a lot of food, of course. Yeah. I mean, last year we donated $65,000 worth of food. Oh, wow. Um, the government's changed the rules so you can actually write off some of that, which is hmm. new in the last mm-hmm. two years. Um, but um, we also have been uh, partnering with people who are like, hey, you know, we need to get nutrition. Um into these programs that are, uh, you know, been traditionally just uh, geared towards feeding people. And they use like their SNAP benefits and all these other things to buy ready-made foods because of the convenience of it and Mm -hmm, stuff. So mm -hmm. there's some third parties out there that are trying to get more nutrition into our, you know, uh, food insecure population, which we work with more and more now. Yeah. So this is kind of like a, where we feel like our farm is at right now. Now, with those organizations, are those mainly in New Hampshire? Because when you think of like New Hampshire, there are more Boston coast areas. No, uh, nothing in Boston. Boston, they really got like it locked up. And that's why we stay out of Boston. Um, mm-hmm. There is the the Boston Gleaners and the Boston Food Pantry are some of the most effective organizations in our area. And they suck down all of the extra food from a lot of the farms. And this actually leaves like, an underserved of the underserved because Uh everything just goes through their existing channels. So we actually avoid them. Okay. Um, uh, And because they're fine. Yeah. (laughs) You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, So we avoid them and we're going through, um, we're going through, uh, there is a, um, the women's crisis center Mm -hmm. uh, in um, it's stationed in Newburyport, but it takes part of the, the, the North shore women in crisis. And these are like really a lot of women that are coming out of abusive situations, either in housing, temporary housing. They could be, um, you know, um, single moms that like, you know, um, ended up, um, you know, um, having to leave their homes due to like, you know, Mm -hmm. um, a pregnancy um, or, you know, an abandoned father situation Um, could be abuse, could be a lot of things. But they end up all, you know, scattered all over the place. There's not like a house. You yeah. Know, um, and or a shelter. Um, but there's this organization takes care of their health care, takes care of some of their, you know, mental health needs, spiritual health needs, but then also is, you know, trying to take care of their nutrition. Yeah. And so they have nutritionists on staff and they try to like figure out like, well, where is all this food going to come from? So we like that small organization is something that we, we would like to work mm-hmm. that we're, we're looking to work with. There's a there's an organization called Gather. It's stationed in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. They take care of a lot of the seacoast of New Hampshire's, mm-hmm. um, you know, needs. They have like remote sites. They do um, they do pop up like markets, but they're mm-hmm. not markets. They're like pop up need things. So they show up and they'll show up in a housing, uh, a, a Section 8 housing project. Yeah. And they set up, it looks like a farmer's market and people just come down and they get the food, but there's a nutritionist there. There's people there to show them how to use these foods, how to cook these food. Like, what are you going to get yeah. out of it? You know? Yeah. And so um, uh, the situation is how do we get like healthy, locally grown food in there? You know? Mm-hmm. Um, and for a farm, it can make a big difference because like with Gather, I've cut a deal with Gather where they do like a cost analysis for me. So like if I'm running over and I have all these overages in my cooler, they can come gather it and they have funds and they can pay cost. They can pay what I like my cost yep. on. So I'm yep. not losing money on my overproduction that I need to be able to meet all my retail and CSA mm-hmm. and wholesale needs. I need that certain amount of overage production. Otherwise I'm underproducing mm-hmm. and not actualizing mm-hmm. all of those retail dollars. So it's an amazing economic opportunity to be able to um, overproduce, but mm-hmm. not lose money nice. on yeah. The, uh, on the stuff that's sitting in your cooler, it leaves. I didn't make any money on it. Yeah. But it served an underserved community. It made it at a cost point that they could afford to pick it up at. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, I mean, you know, we don't want to have to go over the nutrition and nutrient density and all that other stuff. I mean, yeah. I'm sure your, your audience is aware of that. Yeah. But like, we, you know, how do we get this food that, like, let's face it, like, you and I, like, we create food for a lot of bourgeois people. Yeah, like, we do. I mean, I mean, like, how mm-hmm. much? How much are your potatoes a pound? Yeah, they're not cheap. Probably two bucks. Mine a pound, are, but, mine, are yeah. mine are two fifty a pound. Yeah, Re- retail. Yeah. Now, I, I, if you got food stamps and you're gonna buy my potatoes at two fifty a pound, which you can do because I have a snap machine at my thing, or are you gonna go down to Market Basket and buy them for sixty nine cents a pound? Mm-hmm. 
Absolutely. But I don't know when the last time you picked up one of those market basket of potatoes and ate them. Yeah. But unfortunately, I had dinner over my mother's house and she ran out of potatoes and like ran down the market basket and bought them and served them to me. And I was just like, and I was like, what in the world is this? <laughs> yeah. I didn't even know where it came from until it was on my, uh, first of all, I looked at it and I was like, did she cook this wrong? It looks weird. You yeah. Know? And then I ate, I put a, I'm like, I don't know. It's taste, but the taste is nutrients, you know. Yes, so like, yes, there's yes. Nothing here. It is like an empty yes. starch bag. Car so cardboard. Like, <laughs> cardboard. So we're trying to figure it out. So like basically at at cost, you know, my potatoes, particularly like my nicked and ding yep. potatoes, yep. are 40 cents a pound. Yeah. And if I get 40 cents a pound for my nicked dingers, right? Yeah. I'm yeah. covering all my production costs, including washing them. Wow. And someone had to grade them anyway. Yep. 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 And so now we do less grading on the line. You, you've, you've seen my potato harvester. So, you know, like mm -hmm. there's a grading line on there. We do less only yeah. like, we're like, eh, leave it because it'll go, you know? Yeah. And so we do less grading on that line. As long as we know that like it can go some, it's going to go someplace. Somebody's going to eat it. Like, isn't that the yeah. point, you know? Yeah, so. exactly. And I think that is one of the things that, you know, we had an employee here this year who was brand new to like the production side of farming. She come from nonprofit background and bless her heart. But every time we would throw something out, she would go grab it. She was digging through our compost because she felt yeah. bad. And I'm just like, hey, like this is farming. Unfortunately, this kind of stuff happens. And, you know, we were developing some waste things. Like we just found out there's a local a church that would take anything we have extra that's perishable because a lot of this, these these places don't want like salad mix and stuff because it won't have shelf life like onions and potatoes and that sort of thing if they leave yeah. them out they're fine salad in 12 hours is just mush yeah. so um anyway so we just found that out so we're going to start moving some of our like when people don't pick up csa bags i mean perfectly good food but we're not going to keep it for a certain number of weeks so be able to just send that i mean all this nutrient dense awesome food right to someone who needs it is awesome um they there they, it's important like i think for farms to like like we don't have time for that right mm -hmm. yeah and so like you're saying the church and i'm saying like these three or four other organizations it's so great that they just come to the farm mm -hmm. uh, first of all you're not dropping it off second of all like if you have somebody managing your pack out anyway i mean we have a pack out manager which is a little weird description is like what is going to wholesale? What is going to CSA? What is the stuff that's for the store? What is uh -huh. the stuff for um, um, for um, donation? And, you know, our cooler is a rather large cooler. You've stood in our cooler uh -huh. before. I mean, like, it, but like, you could see how that cooler could become a nightmare if it's not oh, managed, yes. you know? So yes. we have a, you know, our packout manager manages the cooler. And so then we don't even have to manage the people who show up. It's on their pallet. Everything uh -huh. on their pallet, they just take and that reduces the cost of being uh, philanthropic to us. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, um, I don't have to babysit these people. I don't have to deliver it. I don't have to do anything. They show up, they grab the stuff and they take off and they know what's perishable. They know, mm -hmm. oh, who I could get this out to, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I mean, our neighbor's cable comes and says, oh, this is a beautiful salad. It's going to be gone in two days. I know a soup kitchen that's running tonight in Haver. We'll run it down to them. Mm -hmm. we'll, we, and, mm -hmm. and and there are volunteers there to make a salad out of it and it's like out of my cooler in somebody's belly in less than 24 hours but yeah. do we have the infrastructure to handle that i mean no, we, no and we shouldn't yeah. you know and yeah and so that's 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 the cool part of that i think yeah it's very cool one of the things you mentioned in their nutrient density talk a little bit about your growing practices i know you're not like certified organic but you do a no. lot of things that are very um regenerative i guess i would say yeah well, our main focus is, you know, I mean, because we have a really personal relationship. I mean, like, we're, yeah. I mean, I am like, you know, first and foremost, a soil scientist. Like mm -hmm. I, I really get into geeking out on, on the soil and Greg and I, um, you know, we compare notes with other farmers and like, we're a little silly. Like, I, I, I mean, like, I, I don't know too many other farmers that are our size that do a soil test on every quad. We have our fields broken into quadrants mm -hmm. and every quadrant gets a soil test every year 
Yeah. So we spend a little like right in uh, between five hundred and a thousand dollars on soil testing a year because some yeah. of our tests are the um like the uh, the organic medium tests and like yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and yeah, so some tests we don't bother with that, but some we're measuring microbial activity in the soil, you know. Uh -huh. And so basically, um, I think like you know, I, I used to think I knew what I was doing. I was like, I see some earthworms, and soil looked good. Yeah, you know? yeah. And sometimes that's just a lie, you know. <laughs> I mean, uh, it, it 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 can look great, and it it's not really a lot going on with that soil. So like everything in, in the, I mean, we're monocropping in strips. Yes. Even though we're a diverse farm. Correct. Yes. <laughs> so anything like that is like, but we're trying to have diversity in our soils. So the object is have maximum diversity in your soils for biota, you know, flora and fauna. Uh -huh. And if you do that, mostly all the other chemical stuff just works itself out in the end. I mean, macronutrients, you're always going to have to tweak, mm -hmm. but we tweak our availability of macronutrients is availability of micronutrients mm -hmm. and understanding the relationships between these nutrient uh, diversities and understanding like fast acting and slow acting. Now, it just so happens that like you're an organic farmer and I am not, but it happens to be that the truth is most of the time, slow acting systems are better for the soil and slow acting systems happen to be organic based systems yeah. because um, so, you know, um, the truth is the truth, no matter which philosophy you're trying yeah. to use. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I mean, like, so think... since we're, since we're not trying to monocrop, we're looking for that diversity so that when we move one set of crops to another set of crops, have we lost the flora and fauna that might potentially help that next set of uh, vegetables that's going through there because we were, you know, in mm -hmm. one other set of vegetables. Now, if I'm growing wheat every year, I don't care. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, so this affects how you're going to manage and why, um, we've moved to mixed species cover cropping and why we've moved to strip cover cropping and why we develop these complex, um, soil management maps, because, um, you end up with these strips in a field. We're essentially strip farmers. Like we farm by the bed, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so like when the bed is done and it's flailed, it's really handy to have like some kind of no-till one bed cedar, or even I've gone through and everybody curses the rototiller, but I've gone through and either used the rototiller or the stone barrier if I have a lot of trash and just gone through with the Sutton cedar, which is my green mm -hmm, cedar, mm -hmm. 17 lines. I filled it up with millet. I filled it up with all kinds of other stuff, yeah. you know, um, and um, clover, whatever. And you go and you can put in just a bed of this, just a bed of that. And the reason that you want to have diversity in the root systems are that the microbial community that, that feeds on those or mixes with those, they interact differently. So it's mm -hmm. not only, you're not only thinking about the system that's around the roots, you're thinking about the ecology. Like who are the lions out in your soil feeding on the guys who are feeding on the root systems? Like are yeah. they specific, species specific? And then you have to start thinking about aggregates, um, um soil organic matter densities because yeah. soil organic matter is going to act a lot like your soil consistency you know mm -hmm. and once you start having to deal with understanding cation exchange capacity then you know even a macronutrient like potassium is severely affected by other cations in the mm -hmm. soil like magnesium and calcium yeah and so if you don't have that saturated medium test to understand how your potassium, calcium, and magnesium are interacting with each other, then those things become limiting. And you might be like, I'm low on magnesium. I'm spraying Epsom salts like a son of a gun and I'm not getting anywhere. But yeah. you really haven't understood what the cation exchange capacity is. So you don't understand what the balance that is needed between the calcium or you drench something because mm -hmm. you're magnesium efficient and you end up robbing your plant of potassium and calcium because you've occupied yes. that that activation site, that ion, with mm -hmm. too much of the, the the charge, and so then then that is not available for exchange, even though it's free floating. Mm -hmm. You do a soil test; it's chemically there, yeah, but it's unavailable. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think that's you... that's kind of the 
where what we what we geek out about here at her on farm it's yeah. like yeah, that that side of stuff. Now you mentioned fast acting versus slow acting, and I think for most lay people, sometimes like the chicken compost that we put on is typically like a slow release fertilizer. It typically, it's, is- it's actually different. Like um um I mean um, just like the yeah. prayers, it's uh it's it's usually five percent nitrogen, yeah. right? Well, two percent of that actually is um is ammoniated. And yeah. so it actually is immediately available to the plant. Yeah. Um, the rest of it has to go through a chemical transformation, which if you we go down the road of uh, applying this in your greenhouse and then you steam your soil, that's a whole thing that chemistry that people need to understand because oh, yeah. you can end up uh, burning your plants. This is a newly emerging thing for me because... I do these steaming talks for the last 20 years and it never occurred to me that nobody would be thinking about the chemistry. Yeah. And, so, and so I actually never apply that. I'm yeah. like applying alfalfa and uh, mm-hmm. cottonseed meals and all these other very yes. nitrogen sources. And everybody's like, ah, oh, my plants are dying. Is it some fungi? And I'm looking at the pictures and there's these collapse and I'm like, what is happening? And I don't know. And they mm. pull it up and their roots look all all brown and i'm like it's a pathogenic fungi it it took over because we killed everything with the steam yeah and then you go and you take a sample and it's like 250 pounds of nitrogen per acre in that little tube yeah. and you're like yeah, yeah oh i know what happened <laughs> you know? yeah you, you just hell out of that. You just yeah. unlocked it all yeah you turned it all into activated nitrogen and so that's the process that steam and why i mentioned that is like that happens in the belly mm-hmm. of some biome bacteria and so either you are your plants are eating the excrement of of bacteria and fungi and you know the the soil biota Mm -hmm. or they're eating the bodies so some flora bodies decay into immediately available nutrients and some just desiccate immediately Mm -hmm. available nutrients they convert tied up stuff to untied up stuff that's the little bit of an oversimplification but like that's pretty much like puts it into perspective as to what's going on in the process. Yeah. And that's the difference between fast and slow. A chemical farmer can apply calcium nitrate. Mm-hmm. And if you apply calcium nitrate and it's 15% nitrogen, all of it mm-hmm. is yeah. immediately available to a plant. So when you see um, a, a, um, a chemical farmer, I don't know what we, I, I hate calling them traditional farmers because how is that tradition? But anyway, yeah, uh, yeah. If, if someone who farms more chemically based, they put that on there and you see immediately greening and things shooting up and stuff like that. Um, if we were to put on, you know, um, even something as high as 11%, yeah. you know, that's not. Even blood meal that is listed as 15% in organic system isn't 100%, isn't 15%. Yeah. 15 pounds per hundred is not all the available. It's much higher percentage of available. Yeah. Chilean nitrate is probably the, the, I think that's the, that's the crack for organic farmers. And it's a cheater code because it's, it is literally all available, right? It, um, yeah, that's the stuff that, um, I mean, I think technically every, you can't have a hundred percent availability for some reason, but basically in the 90s. Yeah. yeah. So basically Chilean nitrate, um, is exactly that it's a cheater code um it's what chemical farmers um when they hear of organic farmers using chilean nitrate they're like you're just using chemicals and it's essentially is a chemical it's like you know it's like it is it was naturally mined and so that's why they're saying it should be but i mean it 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 can destroy soil life so fast Um, it depends yeah i mean like everything you know um it's about a balance um what we don't understand um, what people don't understand in the soil is that you're maintaining an ecosystem, right? Mm-hmm. And so when you apply nitrogen to your soil, then your nitrogen fixers and nitrogen uh, eaters and all of those things, they're being competed against in the system by the application of the nitrogen that they represent, like occupying space. So when you think of something as being a vessel and it's like, it's got 100% is in the vessel, if you have a certain percentage of that being, you know, nitrogen you introduced, that means nitrogen from the natural system can't occupy that space, that physical space. Mm-hmm. And so understanding balance is, is important. We 
cannot unless you're going into like i mean okay it is possible to be fertilizer free not the way i farm um but if especially like if i had an alfalfa rotation i'd be golden right a uh-huh, uh-huh. couple of years in alfalfa you got 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre just sitting there right um but otherwise we're never going to meet uh essentially it's our nitrogen and uh potassium uh requirements phosphorus can be had a lot of different ways um but the but far as my uh, macronutrients without like amending it and it, you you're not going to get there so the question then becomes how do you amend with conscience mm. Not like moral conscience. I guess it is moral yeah. conscience if you're talking about the death of the soil. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, well, it, what do you believe about the world and your role in the world? Because if you believe your role is to leave the earth better than you found it for your kids, and then your beliefs around that, so I guess it comes, it does come right back to moral. It could, or it could be selfish because, like, yeah. uh, like let me make it selfish, right? Yeah. I want to grow these great crops year after year because I'm dependent on the financial outcome, uh-huh. right? Absolutely. If I ruined my soil, I make it more difficult for me to achieve that, you know? Uh-huh. Um, so I think about this with greens production all the time. I always say that greens production is mining my soil because I never beat the hell out of my soil more uh-huh. than when I am in greens production. And that's yeah. why the greens move around on the farm quite a bit. Yeah. So I always think, oh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm withdrawing from that bank um, to make money, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so basically, you know, my soil is my savings account, and I need, I can make withdrawals and li- make a happy, happy mm-hmm. income off of it if I'm always making deposits. But it's a long-term thing, and it becomes selfish that way. But like, this is where I think that like sometimes um you know that you know it it mixes is that like you're right it becomes that your selfishness can become a moral right you know for the world as well so Mm. yeah i i i I, I, yeah i don't think that that's mutually exclusive (laughs) no absolutely no no all right that's awesome discussion about soil and uh, i think actually last time we did talk a lot about soil too but it's such a huge (laughs) topic and i think that kind of shows you know your mindset on it is it's super important to how you grow what would you say is the crop that actually helps your soil the most? Actually, cash crop that you actually sell. Cash crop that I actually sell that helps the soil the most. Well, the system mm. would probably be strawberries mm-hmm. because it's more perennial. Um, and I leave my soil there the longest, mm-hmm. it's like three or four years. And I'm managing tons of organic matter. And my organic matter and cation exchange capacity is our highest in soils coming out of strawberries. Now, disease pressure, though, you have to be careful coming out of strawberries because they harbor so many diseases that, like, you can't plant solanaceous there at all. Well, you could, but you'd be a fool. Okay. Okay. Um, All right. But, um, yeah, particularly tomatoes, insanely sensitive to the same root diseases that strawberries can harbor but not even suffer too much from. Interesting. Um, yeah. So, but uh, as far as like, I mean, strawberries make me a lot of money mm-hmm. um, and the conditions of the soil um, f- coming out of strawberries is probably the best that I can start like a management from scratch, you know, um, often out of strawberries, then I will go right into beans, which is only helping as well because I inoculate Um and so then um, I'm, you know, the, the beans never grow better than when they're following strawberries and stuff like that. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I would say like cash crop, but like, you know, I've made, I've made um, straw a cash crop too. And yes. some of my straw fields have looked pretty delicious. Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, and I've had a couple incredibly successful no-till corn plantings where um, I went in and it's only the good for the soil because in order for us, we do uh, 12 acres of corn a year and nine of them are no-till. And we use a mixed species that we go into and it's a two-year mixed species. So it's grown an entire summer, mm-hmm. overwintered, come into the spring and it's a new set of 
things. So by the time I'm not going to go through the 12 species cropping, by the yeah. time I'm knocking down mainly um, uh, vetch, um, cl um, um, clover, vetch, and um, there might be, you know, some residual from the um, tillage radish and stuff. Yeah, there, yeah. You know? um, but because I, I roll that and put that into corn, and the corn is a lot of organic matter because I'm only yeah. taking the ear and then flailing the rest. Mm -hmm. Those soils seem to be in really good shape. But, you know, by that time, they're through, by the time I'm cropping them, they're into 36 months of Correct. cover. Yeah. 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 You know, so that by the time I'm doing a till. Yeah. So they've been 36 months without a till by the time I've touched it. Yeah. That's the longest stretch that we go. Yeah. I've had some really interesting conversations with Jeff from um, Rodale, and I really want to get Steve Groff on the co podcast because he does um, no-till vegetables. But it, what it comes down to is that the no-till slash very reduced till, and again, you're talking about this 36 months, is that certain crops just don't work like carrots. You can't no. do a no-till carrot. It just does not work through like, no. you know, uh, so you, you really have to have that perfectly prepped bed. But- if you go through, I mean, I can tell you how low the nutrient requirement for the carrot crop that I followed that corn with. Mm -hmm. So, you know, 36 months without tillage and then it gets tilled, right? Now I have to use a stone barrier because of the corn stubble. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah. If so you want to really go in with um, beets or carrots or something small seeded. Yeah. But the stone barriers have changed. Now, like back in the early days of stone barriers, they were rated like some of the most damaged, soil damaging instruments on the, on the planet. Now, NRCS has it. If, you, if it's your only tillage, it's like yeah. rated reduced till. Interesting. What brand do you have again? I have a furrow dough. Okay, so if you actually Google stone barrier, and I highly recommend folks do, it's actually the first... Uh, Furgo is the first result that comes up. So you can check it out. It's it's mind blowing what they will do. Um, I think I've sent you pictures of oh, like the yes. like rye is like up two feet high. And then I can, I've seeded greens into it behind it. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing. And how it works is it has like screens underneath there, which basically put all the big clods and the rocks and all the cover crop further down and then takes little tiny uh, aggregates and layers that on top. So you have that nice seed bed um, that you can get, uh, can work through. So, yeah, it's not exactly the easiest thing to adjust. Um, you have to get familiar with it and understand, you know, a couple of things, but you know, the, the heights and the barrier, you yeah. know, like, cause it, it has a couple of different things. Cause like you're talking about the screens, if it's not pitched correctly, then either you're not gathering enough material to put that sift on top or uh, you're hollow out. Just like yeah. you've probably used a, a bed former and you end up uh -huh. with hollow beds. Yep, you can do yep. that with you can do that with a stone barrier too, even though it's not making a raised bed. You can yeah. just hollow out the, yeah. the bed you're like the bed, the flat bed you're making. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's definitely something folks should ch check out because if you're large scale production, it's well worth the investment. Um, especially if you have a lot of rocks where you want to do high trash seeding. I, yeah, that mainly it's us. We want to do high trash seeding. Yeah. Um, but also we have rocks, but I also own like three different rock pickers. So yeah, <laughs> it doesn't solve the problem of like not picking up your rocks. Yeah. If you decide yeah. that I don't have to pick up rocks because I have a stone barrier, that's a bad, that's a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it just reduces them right where you're trying to seed right on the top, right? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a good one season fix. Yeah, gotcha. All right, really where we wanted to focus this podcast and we kind of veered off, which is completely totally fine because soil is so much fun and a lot of things is we did want to talk about the pandemic because the last time you came on, you were just kind of diving in and really not sure what was going on, but now you've been through that and you saw some very crazy things go on with your business, the market in general, and we just wanted to dive into that. So yeah, yeah. kind of share a little bit about you know the early days of the pandemic and what you guys were thinking. Well, I mean, it was like, you know, like everybody, I think that we had a sudden shock that like, you know, it was going to be a lockdown. Um, it was winter market season. Uh -huh. We had tons of food because we're, you know, we are, we are, you know, um, four season farmers and they were going to shut down our winter markets. And I, and my first idea was like, oh God, what am I going to do? So we hosted, we called up the people 
from the winter markets, the vendors. Mm -hmm. And we said, hey, um, we're just going to start hosting the winter markets at our farm and uh, in the parking lot. And luckily, we have a very understanding, you know, local police force who, you know, um, I live on like a state road, like a state highway road. And you're not supposed yes. to park on the side of. Yeah. Um, and it's very narrow and very windy. <laughs> yeah. So, um, <laughs> and so, so the police just set up and um, they, they parked cars for me. Um, and, you know, we did numbers like um, I had a booth out in the lot with my name on it, but this, it was in the farm stand. So the farm stand was there. Mm -hmm. And so like the farm stand was seeing like, you know, seven, $10,000 days, wow. you know, um, and which is a very hard to keep the food into the farm stand, particularly all the value added. Like mm -hmm. we bring in meats from three different meat farms, all that, you know, we have, um, you know, we have a, a whole wall that's just freezer cases with, other farms stuff in it you know and getting but the farms really made it their pleasure of coming mm -hmm. every day and stocking their own freezer so it became a little different relationship than we ever had before mm -hmm. like instead of ordering the food the farms just started coming mm -hmm. looking what was missing filling it and billing us yeah which they were happy because it was just leaving their their freezers and we were happy because our customers were able to get service. So that was a big change in relationship right there, right off. And then the next phase was like, okay, so what are we going to do? Because, um, yeah, we have some of these people willing to come out to these farmers markets. And this is even before, um, believe it or not, this is before we even knew that, like, you should wear a mask or that, like, mm -hmm. you know, having gloves might be a good idea. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, and, but in my area, the numbers were still very low at the beginning yeah. of the, the lockdowns. Some people didn't have the same experience where the numbers like shot up completely. Ours, it took about a month in before we started seeing, you know, like people dying, yeah. you know, like, I mean, yeah. I mean, I think it took a month before I started like knowing the people who were dying, you know, like yeah. so, and, and in other yeah. cases I've yeah. around, the, around the country that was different. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, and we still didn't know that like young kids, if they got it would probably bounce back, you know, like, we Absolutely. didn't know the biology of the disease mm -hmm. either, you know, so everybody was like, you know, um, lockdown was locked down here and I have market mainly in Massachusetts, Massachusetts took their lockdown seriously. Um, it took about another month for New Hampshire to take it that seriously. And when they did, um, it was an unfortunate like wave of like, we were one of the places like we didn't have any hospital rooms or anything like that. And the mm. governor flipped out and went the other way. So, you know, normally Sununu is like pretty level headed, um, but he was under a lot of pressure not to do anything in the beginning of the pandemic. So he didn't. And then mm. by the time he did, he went like way the other way. And it was like, you couldn't go anywhere <laughs> yeah know, so, yeah <laughs> so it was it was all of a sudden we needed to do home delivery is essentially what i'm getting to if you yeah. wanted people to get your food it was going to be like you had to bring it to them because mm. they weren't going anywhere yeah. um and we had to develop an entire system based upon our wholesale our, our formal wholesale company we had an aggregate with mm -hmm. about 30 different um, local producers that aggregated their food and distributed it to wholesale outlets, stores, schools, mm -hmm. restaurants, institutions, those kinds of things, right? And it was like a, um, you know, it was like a um, $700,000 a year company, you know, yeah. at the time. The pandemic hit, we started doing the whole, that's the other thing is all of a sudden now the restaurants in New Hampshire were closed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's our customers. Yes. For your wholesale. For our business. wholesale. Yeah. So now Three River was sitting there not doing anything. And yeah. Three River is the company that, 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 that I own with a couple of other farmers that did this. So we were like, what are we going to do? So we 
hired all of the out of a bunch, like 12 out of work restaurant workers, brought them into our company, came up with a different routing system and put out a different storefront on the, on, uh, um, that made, so we had two storefronts now, the wholesale side and the retail side. Mm -hmm. And the brilliant thing for this is that like most of the farm, most of the money in our system still sticks to the farmer. Mm -hmm. Farmers post what they want to post in the unit that they want to sell that in. And um, they sell those units. And then that report goes back to the farmer and the farmer packs that stuff out, deliver it to us the next day. And the day after that, we deliver it to the customers. So that's the basic model that we started to go on, which was a logistical nightmare if like farmers forgot one unit, the mm. sort table would be sorting, you know, because we were using bulb crates, which at the time had to be sterilized. Thank God I had a soil steamer. We put all the bulb crates into a refrigerated yeah. truck without the refrigerator on, turned the steamer on for 20 minutes, turned it off, sterilized bulb crates. Then we got our chops busted after the pandemic that like when they finally got around to looking, it's like bulb crates aren't food grade. <laughs> I know, I know. They have too much lead or something in them, right? Is that how it yeah, is? I, I have no idea what's in a bulb grate, but <laughs> they're not food grade. So in any case, that's that's a side story. But, you know, we moved to cardboard boxes after that. But yeah. the um, the point is that we were starting to able, you know, we were doing more deliveries than ever. And at the peak of the pandemic, we were doing over a thousand deliveries a week. Wow. Um, we were grossing over a hundred thousand a week and we ended up the 2020 year at um, $3.5 million in sales. Um, wow. And so um, I think a lot of people saw the boom of local food. Yeah. Um, and I think it was like, are you going to take advantage of this boom and what's going to happen? And that's like, you know, so that went on for like, you know, a year or so more. Yeah. And then the idea is like, okay, so I think the real question now is like, you know, how have you hung on to your bounce back? You yeah. Know? Yeah. Um, because people have gone back to their traditional oh, yeah. sources of food. And so like my farm stand, you know, um, my farm stand PNL, well, actually Hiram Pond Farms PNL for the 2020 pandemic year was about 1.5 million. Mm -hmm. um, so it's farm stand CSA, whatever farmers markets we did, but mostly that wholesale block because we were moving everything through the door to door service yeah. and stuff. Okay. So like now, like today it's 2022, it's November and I'm probably going to close out at like 1.1 to 1.2. Mm -hmm. But prior to the pandemic, prior to all that, um, Heron Pond Farm was about a seven hundred fifty to eight hundred thousand mm -hmm, dollars. Mm -hmm. So what this tells me is that we were able to use the pandemic to bootstrap our sales up and make use of the wholesale market chain to do that, mm -hmm. and then turn wholesale sales into retail retention. Mm -hmm. So those door to door sales. The great thing about door-to-door -door sales, the great thing about all this stuff is like um, there is uh, data. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we know the house, the people's names, their phone numbers, what they spent. Mm -hmm. And so I took all the data of the locale of people who were local. And I was like, okay, you stopped buying from Three River didn't did you like the my first question is did you like the food did you like the product yeah and yeah. they're like yeah well yeah but now i don't have to do that anymore okay i mailed everybody a 20 dollars gift card to my farm stand i'm like come by buy whatever you want and um there'll be a csa sign up form there you could do this like this is the way this works mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. We have a buyer's club, you know, um, it's not as strong discounted as the CSA, but you could do it this way, but you can still have access because our farm stand has so many of those other local foods that they were buying uh, through the wholesale community anyway. Yeah. Come by and see, you know? And so I was able to boost up those 
um, on, you know, the on farm CSA, because we have three remote sites as well. Yeah, yeah. But we were able to get our people who come to the stand and those CSA customers are the most valuable because mm. they are going to buy other food yeah. while they're in the stand. They're going to pick up the share. It's over 50% of the people who pick up a share buy something else. So the share, what's included? Is this your share just vegetables? Um, fruit. Okay. Vegetables and fruit. Okay. Yeah. So you're not, so you're not doing like a customizable. Yours is like a straight standard CSA. There's no swapping. They just get what they get. No, no, no. Mine is not that at all. Mine is infinite choice CSA. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. So basically everything we have available is out in the stand or at our remote sites. And we do it economically for the, for us, the, the customer is unaware that this is for us. So it works out economically. Okay. They just right. think it's a system, right? And they're like, oh, this helps me group my items. We have three groups, A, B, and C. Okay. <clears throat> Basically, I'm going to simplify it because some things only go into group A and some things only go into group C. But like, let's, because of, that's because of price. Mm -hmm. But group A, B, and C are all price points. So everything could possibly be in every single group at a different weight because that's the price point. Uh-huh. And so if you are, we have um, we have the double heron, the heron plus, the great blue and the little blue okay. um, shares, right? Depending on what share you have is how many of each block you get. Uh huh. On our side of the ledger, we know that this equals, you know, for a little blue 2750 a week. Yeah, and it's going to meet that twenty seven fifty a week, and they're getting their ten percent premium built into that twenty seven fifty, right? Yeah. So now I don't care what they take; they could take it all in tomatoes, as far as I'm concerned. I could care less, but mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. provided value to them, and they only took the value that the share was worth from me. Mm -hmm. So that's how infinite choice on our farm works. Okay. And so then at the other levels of your share, the, the plus and that sort of thing, those are different monetary amounts on the back end for you to think through as you're putting the things in there. It makes for like an interesting discussion with your CSA manager because, um, you know, we hire CSA managers that advocate for the shareholders. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, so like, you know, you're doing something, you're like, well, that doesn't fit in that box because it's a dollar more. And they're like, they deserve the dollar more. And I'm like, okay, well, talk to me about deserving this dollar more. Yeah. Like why? Yeah. Why? Yeah, 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 yeah. And my CSA manager comes back and says, okay, well, um, over this many periods and this many things, I have the inventory sheets of going in and out. And actually our value is over because people aren't taking the total number of food because they're underway. So people, <clears throat> because they're underweighing, they've actually thrown more money into the pool of the CSA. They deserve more money. They deserve mm. more yeah. food. So if I'm saying that you get a pound of beans in group A and people are only weighing out it, 0.89 and enough people do that that like my csa manager saying hey i brought this much food it was supposed to have this much value when i came back and i checked the food back into the cooler i had this much value the differential was only this we made three hundred dollars for doing nothing mm -hmm, other than mm -hmm. people shorting themselves food give me the dollar yes so i could give them an extra pint of strawberries or whatever yeah i'm like how do i argue with my csa manager i'm like yeah i guess <laughs> I guess yes. they earned their dollar. But yes, yes. But if I'm not, but in the past, I would go the other way. I would, I would give these people so much food that they wouldn't re-sign up because the number one reason in my surveys, it's too much food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, and then I would total it up, and I'd be like, I'm losing my shit on the CSA. I'm giving them mm -hmm. three times the value. I'm giving them like yeah. forty percent above what they asked for. Yeah, we have a farmer here who. Um, I was in her pack shed for an event and I looked at the board of what they were putting in their share for that week. And it literally was like 16 items. And I was, I was just like, I added it up and I was like, that's a 60 something dollar share. And I know what their yeah. prices are. So they're only like charging like 30 bucks. And I was yeah. the week and I was just like, oh my gosh. So, See, now the whole thing with us is we can offer yeah. all 16, 22. Mm -hmm. I think we maxed out at like 22 different items so far this year. It was a rough year. I think yeah. we could have had some other stuff. And that's not variety, that's things, items, Yeah. right? So we can bring all 22, pick yeah. the ones you want. 
So then you're setting up basically a farm stand at your CSA drop. It's pretty much like, yeah, it's like a farmer's it market. It looks like style. my market. Yeah. It looks like yeah. I go to market. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Because yeah, we right now offer a bag share and <clears throat> we started with that. And now we have the bus, which is our retail stand, which is open all the time. And I'm just like, I really think I'm putting effort and money into packing these shares for people that I don't need to. I'm putting way too much. I'm, I could, they could just walk through the store and what we might end up going to is like a t like an afternoon that the shares, because you just, do people come anytime during the week or they come a very specific time? Anytime, like, well, for we started with like the specific time. Okay. Because you think you need to do that. There's yeah. all this stuff, the sun's coming in. Let me see if I can move over one. I'm going to get out of the sun for your shot. Um, yeah. The, uh, we started like you and, and a couple of things like resistance to infinite CSA is like, you know, I'm going to lose money. Yeah. Resistance to infinite time slots is it's going to become chaos. It doesn't because yeah. I believe in capitalism and it works itself out just like anything else. People don't want to, they value their time. Mm -hmm. They're not all coming on Saturday. You want to yeah. know why? Because too many people come on Saturday and then I had to wait. Yes. The pandemic yes. was awesome for that because we had a max of like allowing like three yeah. family units into our stand at a time. And there was a line outside the stand. You want to talk about people moderating when they would come? They figured <laughs> that out real quick. Yeah. Look at that yeah. line. Nope. Not going to stop now. Not going now. So like the thing is that like, and now we don't have that restriction, of course. So, I mean, but people still kind of don't want to be crowded. Yeah. And um, you know, what it, what it's done, you know, yeah. And the, the value comparatively speaking, like I had to add certain ships. I had to add a person mm -hmm. because they have to stock Yeah, because things just go and you see my stand is small. Yeah, it's very, so yeah. I have high diversity means kind of a smaller basket full of stuff. Yeah. 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 And, and you know, me, I'm like, you know, we were raised on the Arnold pilot. high watch it, but it's gotta, if it doesn't yes. have. Yeah. 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 I don't want to see three onions in the bottom of my basket. I'll no. flip out, you know? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm the exact same way. <laughs> like, so why is that not full? <laughs> yeah. So you have to hire somebody, an extra person. But I would challenge you to do your costs on what it's costing you to bag or box but, well, compared to have pick. a person in the shift. And then also, what is the other value you're getting out of that person on the shift? Yeah. So you have to quantify all of it. So do you have better customer service? Do you, what, what other gains do you, are you able to give them the side jobs? Is your stand cleaner? Yeah. Yeah. All you that know? would be happen. Now the question back for you is, so the advantage for people to sign up for your share is they get a discount off the produce, right? Retail. Sort. Yeah. 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 And it works out what in yours, it works out what? 10% you think? 10%. Okay. Um, and that's the only benefit they get. No. They get 10% off anything in the stand that's not included in their CSA. That's like milk, eggs, yeah. everything. So I, right now I'm having an egg problem because my egg supplier's feed went through the roof. Yeah, yeah. And in order, in order to make my margin that I had been making, I would have to charge $7 a dozen for eggs. It's just like, Ooh, yeah. I know. I know. So yeah. let's set eggs aside for a second. But the rest of the stuff, I make sure that I have a minimum 30% margin. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, um, and most of that is always, you know, it, which is unacceptable in a lot of retail areas, but like just because it's local food, if I go higher, then some of the stuff becomes pretty expensive. But I have other items that like I'm making like 200%. Yeah. Um, Dr. Bronner's soap. I don't know yeah. if you sell that in your stand. No, but um, I'm going to now. <laughs> uh, Dr. Bronner's soap flies off the shelf. Um, little, um, the brown paper towels, um, uh, unbleached, yeah. recycled um, toilet tissues, stuff like that. It's like the margins, like two, 300% on it. Yeah. Um, and you're still like, wait, like go to any health food store, you're undercutting them. I mean, you might be right around grocery store a little above, but like they're yeah. in your store, not in a grocery store. So they're going to pay what, what it is. Um, so 30% off, uh, 30% minimum markup on all local food uh, that's in my stand. So people can come in and they can buy 
cheese. You know, we have like one of the best cheese counters in the area because mm-hmm. I'm lucky enough to have a wife that makes cheese, but also mm-hmm. that knows cheese. Yes. So she recommends like all of these cheeses from all over the region. People come to the stand yeah. just for the cheese. Well, and you're in the Northeast where you have a tremendous amount of small scale farm. You're next to Vermont. You've got New York there. You've got Massachusetts. Yeah. Um, so you've, yeah, the Northeast is food heaven as far as I'm concerned. Well, it's uh, in, in New Hampshire, there's only two cheesemakers. Oh, and really in the whole of New Hampshire? There's only two registered cheesemakers, a bunch of small people that don't yeah. do any wholesale. But the yeah, only yeah. wholesale people are two. Wow. Yeah. Um, but Vermont is yeah. crazy. And yeah. Maine, and uh, you're, you're right, Maine, Mass, Mass Cheese Guild really cultivated that whole thing. Yeah. They did. They're oh. doing real, real well. Okay. So then they get the 10% off. They come to the store. Now, what they look at when they walk in for that week is they look at like a sheet that tells them, okay, you can have, you can have three chalkboard. of this chalkboard, three of these, four of those, two of these, and one of that. Mm-hmm. And that's how they... They fill that thing. All right. I'm going to have you snap a picture of that at some point. And send me they also get an email yeah. with recipes, the whole thing, links to all kinds of stuff, pictures of the farm. A lot of people, um, when I first started this system, before they realized how easy it could be, yeah, felt like they needed a master's degree to pick up their share. And I got a few pushback complaints on it. Yeah. But, um, but after they get used to the idea. But a lot of people come in with their own sheet because they get the email yeah, and they yeah. like make a menu, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. they're like, and so what we had to do is instruct people how to do it. It's like, okay, look, look at all of the available. Forget about the quantities. Yeah, look at the available stuff. Make your menu. Now go back and say, how much of each of these things do I need? Mm-hmm. Now put those into your share. Use that, and if like there's one extra thing you need, buy it. You're getting ten percent off anyway. You're not spending any more than it mm-hmm. would have cost if you had it included in your share. It's just that mm-hmm. you've used up your sharely, you know. Yeah. It's almost like it's because people don't really want a debit CSA. Yeah. If, if, if In reality, this is a debit CSA. Yeah. But they don't want a debit CSA. They want to be told what to do. If yeah. you give people a debit CSA, you will sell less shares. Yeah. You will not sell as many shares if you have a debit CSA compared to giving them guidance on what they're eating that week. And that's just empirical. Like that's mm-hmm. just the yeah. truth. How if I could get... sell all debit CSAs, I would, it would be easy. Yeah. You put it on a debit card, they come in. If it's $600, you just put 660 on the card. You let them use it for the summer. They and come in, they're done. But the yeah. problem with that is at the end of the year, they all have a hundred bucks because they didn't shop. Yes. Yeah. So if you force them, like, the, yeah. You force them to come every week. What do you do if folks can't make a week? Do you allow them to use it? Oh, the yeah. I gave, I gave up the ghost on that a while ago. Just okay. come in and make it up. Okay. I'm still making money. No, like in the home, my managers have shown me that the money we collect, that 10% discount, the shareholders pay for because they don't pick up the food. Yes. Yep. 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 I mean, they, uh, they uh, you want them to, I'm not trying to steal it from them, but it's like yeah. a health club membership. Okay. Correct. Yes. You don't feel bad. You if spend they don't show $20 up. a month for your gym. They're counting on half of those people not showing up. Mm-hmm. So they don't have to charge the people who show up 40. Yes. So basically we're getting our money and we're getting full retail dollar in the end because mm-hmm. they don't show up. So getting picky about letting somebody double up is only making an enemy. Yeah. Just let them do it. Sure, do it. We have the check-in sheets. It's not like they can just say they didn't double up. Yeah. Now you do have a fully staffed stand though, right? Six days a week? Yeah, seven. Seven days, so you're open seven days a week. Wow, that's super convenient. Yeah, we are... We went from six to five just for the fall. Um, we will go to five for the winter. Okay. We take Mondays and Tuesdays off. Okay. But Sunday is probably one of your busiest days. It can be Sunday morning. By the afternoon, oh, nobody wants to be out. But Sunday morning, interesting. Sunday I morning, I had to yeah. put on two people. Wow. Okay. And in the afternoon, I give the person side work. 
Yeah. Yeah. You say, these are the four things I want you to work on. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, Andre, I think we might go ahead and wrap it there. Um, I mean, we had like we didn't four... get to talk about half of what you said. We I know <laughs> it always happens, but unfortunately, this is like I got another meeting after this, and uh, we're gonna we're we'll just bring you back. I mean, like you probably should come on once a quarter, and we'll talk about something different. Um, what we really should do. Um, I have two topics I want to suggest to you, and I'm really near and dear to my heart. Is I'm um, I'm working on a project here in New Hampshire of um, farmer mental health. And um, I mean, there is a lot going on with that. And mainly it's about, for me, it's about preserving marriages, but like, yeah. I guess yeah, yeah, other yeah. people would have other things, you know? Yeah. Um, so, um, and then a topic that a lot of people don't want to talk about. And I would love just to have a weekly get together with you and a couple of other people. It doesn't have to be a podcast that like, I, um, as you know, I, I, I study, you know, um, I studied the Bible pretty intently. Mm -hmm. I studied the, the, the Torah. You study the Bible. It's mm -hmm. the same. It's you know, the Old yeah. Testament of your yeah. Bible. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, every week there's a Parsha, you know, that, that, yeah. we, that is that is studied deeply. And I like to talk to people and relate that to both like, um, you know, mental health, spiritual health, farming you mm -hmm. know, and bringing mm -hmm. it back. So if that's something that you're interested in or that, you know, some of your, your, your people be interested in, I would love to like have a group that we could talk more about it, get more ideas out there. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a grant right now in New Hampshire to help pay for the mental health services for 70 farmers. Only mm. two have taken advantage of it. Um, wow. And we have divorce rates going up. It's stressful what we do, Michael. Um, it can stressful. be both mentally stressful and spiritually stressful for those of us that even have a spiritual life. And imagine if you didn't have a spiritual life, what your mental and marital state might even be in without yeah. that, you know, yeah. and there's people out there that like, you know, um, that don't have these gifts that you and I have been given. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, I'm not looking to proselytize like a perfect, uh, uh, some kind of spiritual path for people, but at least the mental health side, like I really mm -hmm. think, yes, you could gain a lot by having a spiritual, a spiritual health program yeah. in your life, but yeah. at least think about the mental and at least think about like, you know, the fact that like just talking to somebody who know who's a trained professional that could help you understand why you have these fears that lead you to making decisions that put you in a position to be hurt. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. how to stop doing that to yourself and blaming yourself and others and yeah. like ending up with such low self-esteem that like you either get divorced or suicide. Like, like we yeah. want to stop those things from happening. So well, um, I, think I just like, uh, that's my like little last minute pitch for you. Um, yeah, no, yeah. I love, I really, I, I, I 100% agree because farming, I think is the most stressful and then farming as a couple, especially if one, one partner is not as passionate about farming as you may be, or that you, because it, farming can be all consuming. And again, we, we struggle to not make it that way. But if you got two people that are like pulling the same way on that, then it can be less stressful. But if you are the only person doing that, they can see the limited return sometimes on what you're doing or you have a big crop failure and that can be struggling. And mm. I think that's so important. But I think the other thing I wanted to point out, you said, um, you know, you could, you know, again, you could get, um, depressed or you know hurt yourself or something but i think the other thing that people don't realize with this the danger that people run into is that safety is that a lot yeah. of farmers they because they're so overstressed they're trying to get something done they have an old piece of equipment they decide to let the pto run while they hop off of it and there are so many horror stories out there yeah um and kids yeah. so yeah. that one yeah that's no, yeah, we'll, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get back and let's do that. Do you have? And, and one last thing is, I have a bunch of plugs. Can I, can I, can I do yeah. plugs? Go okay. plugs. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> this is gonna air after this, but like on, um, on Sunday, I'm speaking at Mafka on uh, greens production for, um, for profit and for food safety. I'm also speaking on steaming, speaking mm -hmm. on steaming a lot of different places. So I will be at um, the New England. Um, the New England show in Manchester, yeah, New I'll Hampshire, too. and I will be doing a steaming presentation and a um, a cultivating um, mm -hmm. a weed management presentation there. Um, possible potato presentation because somebody might be dropping out. Yeah. Um, I'll be at Grand Rapids 
um, I'll be doing the trade show, but uh, working on, um, I did that new spot at Wing Drosophila trial on blueberries. Yeah. Yep. Um, so I have some information on that. And then I will be on an online uh, forum uh, for the Midwest, Iowa. Um, okay, yep. For their vegetable production thing. And that's another uh, a place to get the steaming information. Yep. And the steaming information, we created a new zone controlling system that you haven't seen before. So I'll send you the information for that. Yes. And then and, I, and last plug is I'll be at Mid-Atlantic in Mid -Atlantic. February. Oh, I'll be there yeah. too. Cool. With the hangout. Awesome. Yeah. Um, Dinner's all around. <laughs> yes. Uh, but you'll be also have the trade show at both those places too, because one thing we didn't talk at all about is your cultivation slash farm equipment company, because you yeah. rep yeah. all of this stuff and you're the guy because you know, like everything intimately. I mean, it's not like you're a salesperson, you're a farmer who uses the stuff and says, oh, by the way, I decided I want to sell it too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, actually, it's the other way around. I, I I actually ended up convincing these European companies to to bring them to the United States because we are so small a platform. Now, a couple of them have really taken off. Like, I think Colt Crest has really taken off since they've yeah. come in into the country. Yeah. You know, Terratech is still taking hold. Sue is becoming more and more prevalent in the uh, in the um, in the uh, farming com community. Yeah. You know, they've been making steamers for the petroleum industry and cement industry yeah. for years, but yeah. Now, all of a sudden, agriculturally, they're starting to really understand that um, that's where some of the roots of their own company came from. Yeah. And then now it has come full circle for them, too. Yeah. So. Well, Andre, it's been a pleasure having you on. We will do this again. And uh, your topics, I do definitely want to do that. Uh, I'll jump on offline with you and we'll have some email back and forth to make sure we kind of craft that. Um, Even but, if we yeah. just have like a small group that we're just yeah. talking shop with, I, and it doesn't have to be something we're promoting. Yeah. I just think that. We, we have enough avenues that we're promoting it within other our own channels, yeah. but like just the more people that are talking about it, the better, I think. So Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Andre, cool. always thank you so much for coming on at this last minute. And uh, it's always interesting inf information. All right, man, you take care. Great to see All you right. again. All right. Absolutely. Bye -bye. Hey, Thriving Farmers, here's a quick heads up to save the date, December 1st through 4th, for our Thriving Farmer Summit, Value Added. If you're looking to add income to your farm with simple, proven strategies, go to www.farmsummits.com and drop your email. Our summit series have been viewed by over 100,000 farmers and get rave five-star reviews. In this summit, we'll share detailed strategies for farm ferments, herbal foraging, tinctures, pickles, farm kitchens, foodscaping, mushroom jerky, and mushroom kits, developing add-on shares for your CSA, how to publish books with your farm story, starting your own USDA processing plant, and starting a farmer co-op. Over 35 speakers are sharing their wisdom. Go to farmsummits.com to reserve your spot today. So there you have it, another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.